Hey guys, it's Tim. Today's talk is going to be on Christianity, so finally I get to get it out of the box and just talk about Jesus all day long. So I can't possibly pack everything into this talk, but here are a few of my ideas about Christianity. Okay, when I talk about Jesus Christ, one of the things that I'm going to focus on is this, that he's God in human form, according to Christians. That God came down here and took on the form of a human to do what he needed to do. Well, this isn't the first time that's happened. Remember when I talked about Hinduism? They say that if God picks an animal or a human form to travel around on planet Earth in, they call that thing an avatar. We also call that thing an avatar on video games, so we could go off on that direction. I don't want to spend all that time, but this means that Jesus, if I can get my pen to work, is an avatar by the Hindu definition. Okay, the second thing I wanted to focus on is the fact that he challenged the pre-existing order of society at the time. There was a lot of factions among the Hebrew people, Pharisees, Sadducees, so on and so forth, the Essenes. But there was also the challenge against the Roman authorities. Not only did he challenge the pre-existing order, this is why I love him, because he's a hell raiser, but he stressed this equal view of all people. Well, that's kind of a dangerous idea, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But that everybody is equal, and one of my favorite stories is him at the well, where he proclaims himself for the first time to a woman who's a Samaritan who's been married a bunch of times. All these strikes against her, he goes right to the marginalized. Okay, so here's a quote from Jesus. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I just love this, because one thing I talked to Father Andre about is this, that the teachings of the world are upside down to the teachings of Jesus. Speaking of which... Here's my homeboy, the Pope. <laughs> Pope Francis says, what do the world tell us? Seek success, power, and money. What does God tell us? Humility, service, and love. We're the ones that do the choosing. Okay, so the other thing about Jesus that most people already know probably is he was born of a virgin birth, the Virgin Mary. And so here's the whole, you know, nativity scene. But he's not the only deity that was born of a virgin birth. I think even Lord Krishna was born of a virgin birth. But we'll get into that in more detail later with some of the other deities. Now, Jesus, uh, I'm going to focus on two different things, what he did and what he said. Okay, what he did, doing good deeds, challenging the society, you know, hanging out with the riffraff, the misfits. But what he said. His parables and analogies, because I love the way Jesus talks, just like I like the Tao Te Ching, you know, where it uses grass and trees and things instead of just directly saying it to you. Speaking of which, one of my favorite parables is the parable of the sower. So this is Tim's cutesy version of the parable of the sower. There was a farmer, according to Jesus, that went out to sow his seeds, S-O-W. Okay, here it is over here. <laughs> so in the old days, they would just get a handful of seeds and they would just cast them out into the wind. And some of them, he said, would land on the stony path. But pretty soon, the birds would just come and gobble them up. And some of the seeds would land over here on the rocks. And those seeds would get scorched by the sun because their roots couldn't get very deep. And some of the seeds would land into the thorns, but they would get choked out. But some of the seeds did land on good earth, and guess what? They produce fruit, and that's what the abundance in your life and stewardship is all about. It's not just the fruit you're going to get, but you'll thrive in the right environment and be able to bless other people. I just love this. This is why I love Jesus and his ideas. Actually, the teachings of Jesus involve a lot of radical ideas. Think about the golden rule. Treat other people the way you want to be treated, not the way they're currently treating you. Like, it's easy to be a dick to somebody that's being a dick to you, but to swallow your pride's a little bit harder. Love your enemy. Oh, it's easy to hate your enemy, but to love your enemy, that's pretty upside down or radical. Turn the other cheek. It's not just that someone smacks you in the face, you turn the other side of your face. No, it has to do with verbal insults, Tim. If someone insults you, you don't get into a big fuck you fest with them. The next one, blessed are the meek, for they shall... In I thought the strong would inherit the earth. Why, the, why would the meek inherit? You shouldn't be meek. You should be like strong and be a bully, right? <laughs> and finally, many outcasts enter heaven before the routinely religious. Oh, this is why I love Jesus. 
but his radical ideas involve radical consequences. Now, if you roll into old school Rome, it's like they have a bunch of these on the outskirts of town. It's not just like, oh, you know, a cross. It's like worship Jesus. It's like, no. It's like those are the things we put on pe people on that get out of control with their radical ideas. It's kind of a warning symbol. Like, don't get a little bit too uppity, boy, or we got one with your name on it. Okay, so here we go. Here's one of his radical ideas. The law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What? I mean, that's so next level. Because my father, he gives his sunlight and rain to both the evil and the good. And so if you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're only kind to your friends, how are you different? Oh, we, Jesus, you go, boy. Oh, my goodness, is this good. Okay, so not only did Jesus suffer some radical consequences, but the people that came after him, the saints, and I'm not going to go into the saints, but this is St. Sebastian, but they were also tortured, killed in all kinds of different ways. Why? For spreading a philosophy of radical ideas. Okay, speaking of which, if you haven't seen this movie, I think you should see it. I love Martin Scorsese, but this movie Silence is awesome because it's about the Christian missionaries that went over to China and that were, you know, tortured in unspeakable ways. And I think it was in the 1400s, and I think they became sainted eventually. Okay, so the last thing on this little section, I have Stephen Colbert on here for a reason. Why? Here's his quote. If this is going to be a Christian nation that doesn't help the poor, uh-oh. Either we have to pretend that Jesus was just as selfish as we are, or we've got to acknowledge that he commanded us to love the poor and serve the needy without condition. And then admit we just don't want to do it. Okay, in this next section, I want to talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection, because those are the most important ideas out of Christianity. It's what distinguishes it from everything else. And so when I talk about this, I usually talk about the Passion, which were the last hours of Jesus. And you have Gethsemane over here. I've written a book called Gethsemane. And then you have him put on trial. And here he is with Pontius Pilate, who's talking to the crowd, saying, do you want Jesus or Barabbas? And then eventually they say, you know, give us Barabbas and put Jesus to death and crucify him. And then here he is carrying his cross up to Golgotha. Now, when he's with Pontius Pilate, this is why I love Jesus, because he steps into his power. Because Pilate is saying, hey, don't you realize I can crucify you or let you go? And Jesus says, uh, the only power you have comes from above, from my daddy. It's like, yeah, these people have delivered you to, or delivered me to you, but really the only power you have is from God. The other thing that he goes on to say is that he goes, Pilate goes back to the crowd and says, shall I crucify your king, even though I've found no fault with him? And the crowd goes, crucify him, put him to death. And eventually they lead him away uh, to the hill, which is called Golgotha, where they crucify him. Speaking of crucifixion, this is why Jesus is my hero out of all the spiritual heroes. Because he nutted the fuck up. He took one for the team. He didn't like say, put up your dukes or give me a gun or whatever else. It's like, I'm going to go out there knowing what they're going to do to me. I'm going to take it like a fucking man. Now, I usually talk about the beehive in my other uh, class. Why do I have this beehive on here? Because did you know that when bees sting an intruder that's trying to destroy the hive, that they actually disembowel themselves? They take one for the team. They killed themselves for the hive. That's what Jesus did. He took one for the team. He killed himself for the hive. This reminds me of some of the soldiers in Vietnam. There were 63 of them. <laughs> they jumped on hand grenades and got the Medal of Honor after their deaths. And why did they jump on hand grenades? To save their buddies, they took one for the team. They jump on that hand grenade just like Jesus jumped on it for all of us. And that's why he's my fucking hero. He did something. And then three days later is the resurrection. 
Three days later, after they put his body into the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary come by and say, okay, we're going to dress the body and do the things we need to do. And uh, the stone was rolled away from the tomb, and on top of the stone was an angel. And the angel says, I know why you're here. I know who you're looking for. And he ain't here no more. He is risen. He is risen. And that's what the apostles were about afterwards. The apostles were sent on a mission from God. That's why I think everybody's an apostle, including me. I'm on a mission from God. This is what my life is about, is to spread the good news. And I don't care what the world says, because the world is upside down. And I'm going to cut across all classes and talk to the marginalized. And the other thing is, no matter what happens to me, and I can't imagine how other people do it, but I see the joy in their face in the midst of persecution, because I know those people. I see them up at St. Patrick's. See, this is what the Bible says. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil because you claim my name. I love St. Paul because he went through a lot of fucking bullshit. In Corinthians, it kind of recounts all the stuff he did. He's like really going off this day. He goes, uh, are these Corinthian servants of Christ? Well, maybe I'm crazy, but look what's happened to me. It's like I've been in jail, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, stoned, all these different things. I went to build a fire on one of the islands and a snake bit me. And everybody said I was going to die. I mean, he just went on and on and on. But some of his letters, especially from prison and other places, you go, wow. How did this person have this much joy in the midst of so much worldly discomfort? Okay, when I talk about the Bible... We've already kind of talked about the Old Testament because that's when I went into Judaism. That's why I don't focus on the Old Testament. It's nice for reference and how it led up to the coming of the Messiah, but New Testament. I'm a Christian. I'm not Hebrew. I'm not Jewish. So the Gospels are the core of the New Testament. There's a lot of other books, but this core is four different accounts of the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I do want you to remember that for the test. Now, later on, the next religion I'm fixing to talk about is Islam. They kind of see that the Quran is an extension of this because it all comes from Abrahamic roots, right? But that's kind of a radical idea. Okay, the last little slide I have on this section, you can see the original manuscripts down here. I don't know, well, you probably can't see it, 100 AD to 1500 BC. It's like, and so one of the ones that I'll talk about is the Vulgate, St. Jerome. And then I'll talk, well, here's King James, and then the newer versions are up here, too. I also mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls because I think I showed you something from the Gospel of St. Thomas last time. Okay, in this next section, I wanted to address two different doctrines that Christians ascribe to. And the first one is called the Doctrine of the Trinity, from Catholicism, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit thing, right? And so the idea is God can come in different forms. We kind of talked about this with Hinduism. Brahman can come as Brahma or Shiva or also Vishnu, but we're talking about Christianity now. So God the Father, well, this is the way I like to look at it. Like water is all the same, right? H2O. If I'm doing this right. H2O. But water can look different. Maybe it looks like a liquid. So maybe God the Father is like a liquid, like an ocean of water. Whereas God the Son is more concrete, like ice, like it's something I can reach out and touch, right? Or the Holy Spirit is more ethereal, kind of like a cloud or a vapor. So all of it's H2O, but it comes in different ways to us. Okay, I hope that made sense. Okay, the next doctrine, which I wanted to spend a little bit more time on, is the doctrine of atonement. The idea is that we were estranged from God. Why? Because of original sin. I'll show that in a couple of seconds. But the original sin was Adam and Eve eating the apple over here from the tree of knowledge. So once we got cast out of the garden, there was this estrangement. And so God had to send his only son, Christ, down to earth to rectify for that estrangement, the original sin. Now, I wanted to focus a little bit more on the word sin for a second before I come back to original sin. 
this sin just means estrangement from God, a distance between me and God. So anything that I do that distances me from God is a sin. That's not really a moral idea. It's just more of a distance idea. Okay, and so atonement, reconciliation with God, that's a big part of Catholicism because we have something called reconciliation. So I've made a distance, and now I need to come back close to God again. So I don't want to go all prodigal son again uh, on this part right here, but I can talk about the prodigal son right here. Now, where does the term sin come from? It comes from archery, actually. When you shoot at a target and you miss it, it's called a sin. You just missed it. And so in the same way, we as humans are going to miss it. And so instead of beating myself up all the time, it's like, well, if I made a mistake, a sin, maybe I'll try better next time. I don't want to keep making mistakes purposely over and over, missing the target on purpose, but I'm going to try to hit the target a little bit better next time. Now, the original sin, like I mentioned, was Lucifer came to Eve and convinced her to feed the apple to Adam, and they ate of the tree of knowledge, and then they were cast out of the garden. And so we have this idea of Lucifer, you know, this fallen angel. He was cast out of heaven by St. Michael. And so here's, you know, some reference to Lucifer from Revelations 12, 9. Now, there's the other part that I don't really believe in. I could talk about Lucifer all day long, and I will in another lecture, but is this whole hell idea. It's like, okay, God is going to cast us into hell, and this comes out of Revelations. I have a few different, you know, quotes for it right here, but this idea of eternal damnation or hell that we're going to suffer if we estrange ourselves too far away from God. But like Father Andre tells me, <laughs> Jesus didn't come here to condemn. He came here in the name of mercy. He offers mercy to everyone. Okay, and so I'm going to get back to this idea about sin being just a physical distance between man and God. So that's how I define hell. Hell is not a physical place. Hell is a psychological place. Wake up. You're already there. <laughs> All these people, you know, that are worried about, you know, being in hell, you're already there in a way if you've been distanced from God. So psychologically you experience all these different, you know, things we label on psychology. But if I could bridge that distance somehow between me and God, then I would be in heaven, so to speak. And so that is why God sent his only son, John 3.16, up here because he loved the world so much. And that Jesus then serves as this bridge between man and God, the reconciliation between the schism that we originally created. I hope I did good right there. Okay, so Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. The way, well, that's what you call the Tao. <laughs> I don't want to go off on that for a minute. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I like to think of Jesus as a bridge. But when he says through me, I think Jesus is pure love. So I would replace that word with love or agape, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, I know I'm going to get emotional in this section, but this section is my little testimony, and I call it Lost and Found. Because based on that distance thing, I've been way far away from God before. I've been to some sordid places, and uh, I just want to talk about the distance. Because I think there's only two kinds of people in the world. There's people that are lost, and there's people that are found. Speaking of which, back in the year 2000, I was really lost. And I was trying all this different stuff and going to New Age churches. And I went down to Machu Picchu, which is right down here in Peru in the year 2000 with Carolyn Mace and a group of New Agers. We went down and, you know, I remember spending a day right here. And all the tours were down here. And guess what crazy Tim did? He climbed to the top of this and sat right up here. And everybody's like, where's Tim? And finally, I climbed back down. And everybody yelled and screamed. It's like, people have died going up there. It's like, not this guy. Because I live to tell about it. But that's not what this story's about. Few days after this happened, I went out drinking alone in uh, Cusco, the town we're staying at. Met some guys at a bar, and you know, started asking around. I started looking for drugs. Crazy white boy down in a foreign country, third world country, looking for drugs with some locals he doesn't know. Well, I just remember going to a bunch of bars, and then pretty soon I don't remember anything. And I came out of a blackout in a gutter, and there's about five or six people beating the living shit out of me. Just taking turns on my fucking white ass. 
I'm not saying I didn't have it coming, but man, I got the living snot beat out of me. I can't believe I made it alive out of that place. After they were finished and took everything I owned and my passport and my money and everything, they left me, you know, kind of on the side of the road for whatever. And I remember it be three in the morning. I was just sitting there going, how am I going to get back? I don't even know where I'm at. I'm so drunk and out of my mind. I just got my ass handed to me. I don't know how to get back. And I remember looking down the street at three in the morning. I see a pair of headlights coming. It is a taxi cab. And it pulls up to me. And the man starts to talk to me in Spanish, but I don't understand a single word he's saying. And the only thing that can comes to my mind is my hotel is right next to this enormous statue of Jesus Christ. Just like in Rio de Janeiro, they have one in Cusco. And it's just if I can get back to that statue, then I know I can get back home. And so I reach into the cab with my head and I say to the man, I'm lost and I need to get back to Christ. And on so many levels that reverberated through my soul because I was so lost on a spiritual level at that point. Just looking for anything that would just ease the suffering. I didn't care if I died that night. I really didn't. But Jesus had another plan for me because that man understood I'm lost and I have to get back to Christ. And he drove me back to Christ. And that's the day that Timothy Larry got found. I wouldn't be your teacher unless I came out of the gutter on that day. So see, I know what lost is like. And I also know what found is like because I've been saved. And I know there's no price for me to pay. But the price and the way I look at it is this. The reason I came out of that gutter that day is for stewardship, to dedicate myself to Christ and to do his work and to shed the light as much as I can shed it in this world because I got saved in Cusco, Peru that day. Ooh, sorry I won't get so emotional for the rest of the time. It's pretty straightforward and technical, but here we go. For the test, I want you to know the three kinds of Christianity. We'll start off with Roman Catholicism because that's the beginning. And then there was the schisms that led to Eastern Orthodox and the Protestant religions. Okay, so Roman Catholicism. Ironically, the same people that, you know, helped put Jesus to death were also the ones that officially recognized Christianity as a religion in 313 AD. I think that's Constantine. I don't know if that's the Edict of Milan, but something like that. But anyway, like, you know, he kind of used the religion away, but whatever, it became officially recognized. And then um, the church became the authority and the Pope was infallible. So that gave a lot of political power. You know, eventually you'll go into the Holy Roman Empire and you get an empire out of it, not just a religion. I don't think that was Jesus's, you know, intention, but you had to go to the church, you know, to get the interpretation of scripture. That's another power source. So we're going to hold all the knowledge. You know, we also have the Pope here. We have like a lot of political, you know, military power, whatever. Originally, I didn't know, but originally, I guess the scripture had been translated into Greek because Greek was the more sophisticated language within Rome and only the common people spoke Latin. And that's uh, eventually where St. Jerome was commissioned, I think, to make the Vulgate, the Latin form of the Bible. And then that Latin form was how it was, you know, expressed all the way up into really Vatican II in some ways. Okay, I don't want to go into all that, but I think I did a pretty good job on that part right there. I could have got a few things wrong. Okay, so here's my guy again. I love Pope Francis because he doesn't go that I'm infallible route. He's the other way around. You know, he washes the feet of the prisoners. He also says we've created new idols. I love him. We've turned to the worship of the golden calf and we idolatrize money without a purpose. Okay, don't give me. <laughs> one of the other things that the catholic church was able to do is provide some sacraments i mean 
not only baptism but in confirmation these kind of things but matrimony you know to where you can sanctify marriages and whether you like it or not that stability within the community to have families that are sanctified and they have kids and then there's formation all these different types of things okay so sacrament of the sick you know all these different other things i could get into you don't have to know any of these sacraments for the test Okay, one of the early ideas is the Pentarch. I learned this from Father Andre that there was five early churches. You know, Rome is the center if you think about it, because that's where the Pope is coming out of. But you have these other establishments or established churches as well. And so the five fingers of the original church, and you can see the little map up here of the Pentarch. You don't have to know that for the test either. Okay, so the Holy Roman Empire just have this map, but you know, Holy Roman Empire stretched out. And it started to dominate Europe, you know what I mean? So it had nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with money and power. <laughs> so the HRE is different. That's the corporation from a William James perspective than personal religion, which is like, how have I been saved by Jesus Christ and how am I living my life of stewardship? Okay, so there's a schism that most people talk about. It happened in 1054 where the Eastern churches kind of broke off from Rome. That kind of makes sense because Rome is kind of like being the big bully. And it's like you've got the center of power. The Eastern people are going, well, we don't want to be under the authority of this infallible pope. And there's also other political and economic concerns that cause for this schism in 1054. And so you get these Eastern Orthodox churches. But even recently, the pope has gone back to uh, try to bring these people back. Not to make them Catholic, but to make peace between these two factions that hadn't had peace for almost whatever a thousand years. Okay, so the schism of 1054 you can see right here. I mean, a lot of that just has to do with like, that's kind of European and then you're kind of getting into a different culture over here right you know what i mean eastern european and even bordering on you know stuff like over in turkey and stuff like that okay enough about that so the eastern orthodox like i mentioned is very similar has the same sacraments and everything but there's no pope they have christian councils it's more democratic in this way christian consensus and the laity and clergy is more informal like the laity uh priests can marry and stuff like this but that's what i think the catholic church should do let the priests marry let women be priests this that and the other but people don't want to hear all that bullshit okay so that's enough about those first two the third type of Christianity is Protestant. So there was another schism. Most people know it's like, are you Christian or Protestant? They don't really know about the Eastern Orthodox schism thing. And the only reason I do is because I have to teach this class. But in the late 1500s, like another break occurred. And this word comes from protest. If you're a Protestant, really it means you're a protestant. You protested the Catholic Church. It's like, at first it was, uh, in order to reform the Catholic Church and get them to do what Martin Luther wanted. Like here's Martin Luther in 1517. He nails these 95 theses, things he wants reformed in the Catholic Church of the church door at Wittenberg. I always say this is the ballsiest thing ever. It's like, dude, the, the Inquisition, have you ever heard of it? The Catholic Church can do shit to you. <laughs> They're just going to nail 95 things right to the church door of what needs to be fixed with the Catholic Church. Now, eventually, I think he had to go into hiding, but he had to defend himself at the Diet of Worms in 15, I think this says 21, and he'd go up against, you know, whatever, uh, the authorities at the time, the Pope, and say, like, look, this is all based in Scripture. See Father Andre for more detail on this. Okay, besides Martin Luther, and if you think about one of the first kinds of Protestants are called Lutherans right after martin luther also calvinist after john calvin but i won't talk about it here um johannes gutenberg i usually talk about as well why well he was a printer he invented a printer printing press but the first thing he printed on it basically was the bible oh shit that's not good news for the catholics because now everybody can get a hold of a bible used to you had to go to the clergy to get a bible now everybody can get a hold of it it might still be in latin but then when it gets translated from La out of latin into other languages it's like oh snap now we don't have everything under our control and you have to come to us and everything's a mystery and now there's open room for interpretation then you say oh that's a great thing 
But some of what the Catholic faith had an idea or mine was good. This is why I do like mass. It's the same across the whole world, everywhere. All the readings are the same, but don't get me started. <laughs> hey, this denomination's idea lead to splintering and everybody would see each other different. I kind of agree with it a little bit because now you get all these denominations of Christians that don't like each other. It's like, yeah, but isn't the only requirement is like you believe in Jesus? I mean, is there anything else? And so this is the Tower of Babel, in case you're wondering. I don't know if you remember in the Bible where they're going to build a tower up to heaven. And then God struck them and cursed them, and they all spoke different languages, so they couldn't communicate with each other, and they wouldn't be able to, like, attain their goal. Oh, isn't that this? <laughs> okay, so here's how I'm going to end it today on a good note. The Tower of Babel thing. Here's the Christian family tree. We started off here with Jesus Christ, root and foundation. <laughs> we ended up way out here with all this different stuff. At the heart of the matter, and I say heart for a reason, is this. Love. That's why I say I am the way. The way is love. Not to be confused with all kinds of Greek forms of love, including eros, romantic love. Philo's brotherly love, but I think it's another kind of love. I won't start crying yet, but it's called agape. It's called agape. And that's all that Tim wants to be. And a lot of times I get real hateful because I'm a hurt little boy down here on the planet and I don't know what I'm doing. But see, in the end, this is what Jesus said. There is only really one great commandment, or I could say two. One of a, a lawyer asked him a question one time, was tempting him, and says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's the only two things that Jesus is about. And if you want to know what my religion is, there it is right there. I love God, and I want to try to be loved to other human beings.